turn on my microphone. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming again tonight. Uh, I say these uh, Thursday evening talks uh, twice a month, or almost twice a month, uh, started in October. Uh, with the advice of some of the some of the leaders here, some of the uh, staff, and so uh, had a good response. Uh, I told them, I says, you know, I'll I'll do the teaching, but you guys need to help me pick the topics because I'm not good at picking topics. Give me something, I'll teach on it, but don't ask me to pick the topic. For whatever reason, I'm not good at that. So. Um, We've, we've worked together and they've chosen several topics. Well, one of the things they said is, why don't you tell your story? Why don't you tell the story, not just of your conversion, but your, you know, your relationship with the Lord? Uh, because it certainly begins long before my conversion, my entrance into the Catholic faith. And so uh, tonight is maybe a little bit less about Catholics in the public square and more about uh, my walk with the Lord and coming into the Catholic Church. But I think that's important for life in the public square because uh, as Catholics, uh, you know, out doing our jobs, out in public and all that stuff, we are still, uh, still, you know, 20% of the population. And uh, even though anti-Catholicism is nowhere near what it used to be, it's still kind of subtly out there. Uh, and so um, being able to give a strong witness and to be sure and happy about who we are in our faith uh, and to be affirmed in that is something very important. And hearing the story of someone who comes to the Catholic Church uh, who is not Catholic but who comes into it um, is oftentimes encouraging. Uh, I've found it encouraging for myself when I hear other people's stories. And so uh, in sharing it with the staff, they says, you need to, you need to share that. So here we go. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, always good, and revealing your goodness to us and your love to us in Jesus Christ. Lord God, you help us to fall in love with him, uh, to come to know him, to speak with him, to uh, listen to him, and in so doing, he draws us close to you, to be in your presence. Uh, and so, Lord God, we thank you for your closeness to us. We thank you for removing the barriers that stood between you and us, some of them in the world, but many of them inside of us, that you gently remove those and you pull those away so that we may see you, hear you, know you, love you. Uh, Lord God, you have given this to us and revealed this to us uh, in our hearts and in in our, in our prayers, and also, Lord God, in your church. And so we ask your blessing tonight upon our gathering. I uh, would ask your help in my sharing my story, that you might be glorified all the way in every part uh, in telling the story of, well, the story of uh, my journey with you, Lord, and that others might be encouraged and see similarities or differences, or, but remember and know their journey with you, and how important it is to know and to remember and to thank you and to share that journey. For you are always good to all of us and you draw us close to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, um, the story of my life with Jesus. Here we go. From Father Chauncey Winkler. <laughs> Um, as far back as I can remember, I remember knowing and loving Jesus, right? In the house I grew up in, we prayed, we went to church, we prayed at the table. My sister and I, every night, when we, you know, okay, get on your pajamas, we come out, okay, I'm in my pajamas, okay, go brush your teeth, okay, we have to come back, brush our teeth, okay, go to bed, and then we go to bed, and then the deal was we get into bed, we climb into bed, and then we say, ready for prayers! And mom and dad would come in the room and pray with us, and we'd go to sleep, tuck us in, say our prayers. So praying with them, praying for other people, uh, that was an early part of my, uh, my growing up, my childhood. So I have known and loved Jesus as far back as I can remember. Um, I grew up in 
with my family going to the Lutheran Church from Missouri Synod, uh, which I enjoyed very much. I, I still love very much. Um, I was standing next to my dad in the pew and we were singing. We had the 1942 Lutheran hymnal, which I still have on my bookshelf in my library. I love that book. Um, and singing the liturgies, right? Singing, uh, singing the, the prayers that we find in the scriptures. The, we would sing on Sundays, we would sing the different, the Benedictus, the Magnificat, the Nunc Dimittis, the Te Deum. The titles were in Latin, but we always sang them all in English, right? So the Benedictus is uh, Zachariah's song uh, to God when, uh, when he hears of uh, John the Baptist uh, being born with, it, with his wife. The Magnificat is Mary's song when she visits Elizabeth. The Nunc Dimittis is Simeon's song in the temple when he lifts up the Lord as Mary and Joseph bring him for presentation. And the Te Deum is just an ancient Christian hymn, uh, traditionally written um, by uh, St. Augustine and uh, St. Anselm? Anselm. I get Anselm and Athanasius mixed up all the time. And I, uh, but anyway, uh, with St. Augustine and his teacher. So uh, growing up, learning those, singing next, next to my dad, those hymns, and gaining that love for, um, gaining that love of scripture, that love of song, of singing and praying, um, that love of uh, uh, the liturgy, really, singing the liturgy, um, that, that developed in me. And the love of the crucifix, because as good Lutherans, there were crosses in the church, there was also a crucifix. And so um, to, to, to love the cross was an, is an important part of uh, Lutheran theology. When I didn't understand the sermon, I would just sit there and read the Bible. There was always a Bible in the pew, and I would just read the Bible in the pew because I didn't know what the pastor was talking about, right? I was a kid. So I would just sit there and read that. I remember when uh, mom and dad, would, you'd go up for communion. My sister and I would sit there and mostly behave, <laughs> right? Mom and dad would go up to communion because in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, they still have the rail, right? And so then they would go, then they would come back and I could smell the wine on their breath and I didn't really know what that was. We didn't have a lot of alcohol in the house, so um, uh, I remember just seeing that. Then after church, we would go for donuts and coffee. I liked that. My parents always had to drag me out of bed on Sunday morning, right? I was one of those kids. I'd get up for school because I had to. I had a routine. But on Sunday morning, for some reason, I don't know, maybe because it was after Saturday, where I had a chance to not have to wake up so early, although I did for cartoons, typically to watch them, but um, my mom and dad had to come and get me up on Sunday morning. So my dad's routine was this. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. My dad's routine was this. Chauncey, it's time to get up, right? He goes out, 10 minutes later he comes back. Chauncey, it's time to get up, and then he comes over and takes the covers off my bed and puts them on the floor. Then 10 minutes later comes back in with a glass of water, Whoosh, right? Now, you say, oh, that's mean. It's not mean because it was the same pattern. He, did, he never came in, first of all, with a glass of water, and he never came in the first time and tore the blankets off my bed. It was always a progression. I knew what was coming next, and I knew, you know, I, I had to decide what was going to motivate me to get me out of bed. So it worked. And so he had to get me out of bed to go to church, uh, and I'm glad he did. Because once I got there, I learned to love it. Uh, I learned uh, to love, and, and the coffee and donuts afterwards, my grandparents went there. Sometimes we go to lunch afterwards uh, with them uh, or with some other, our next door neighbors were Lutheran, and so we, we often meet them at church. Um, and I just enjoyed that. I remember going to Sunday school and drawing pictures and learning about Jesus and his love, right? I often got in trouble in Sunday school. Don't know why, but I did. I was often the kid that the teacher had to come out and talk to my parents about me because I was goofing around. I wasn't doing bad stuff. My, I was just, my parents' frustration was not that I was bad. I wasn't a bad kid. I was just goofy, right? I would get in trouble for doing goofy things and being a distraction. So um, in any case, that's my, you know, growing up and, and learning to love that. Um, I remember one uh, Sunday, 
uh, we decided it was on Saturday evening, and I think two of us were sick. Mom, mom and dad wasn't feeling so good, and maybe my sister was sick, I'm not sure, but anyway, we decided to have church in the house, because we weren't be able to go to church, so we decided that. So I pulled out the little children's Bible, and we found the readings. My dad helped me to find what the readings were going to be that Sunday, and we picked one. We found it in our little children's Bible, and I read that out, and then I worked with my dad on kind of preparing like a little one-minute sermon. <laughs> I think I was like nine or ten years old. Uh, and we set up the piano bench and put a green towel over it and had a cross standing on the... And we had, you know, 15-minute church <laughs> there in the house. And I remember that because we needed, to, we needed to celebrate. We needed to thank the Lord. We needed to pray to the Lord on Sunday because we couldn't go to church because my parents were sick. So we did that. Um, fond memories. When, uh, when I was about, let's see, I don't know, probably, probably 11 or 12, um, my parents were watching a television show. It was a movie on television. It was after our bedtime, but I couldn't sleep. So I had this way of sneaking out through the hall and sneaking kind of behind the couch to watch what they were watching on television. And I don't know how, but eventually they figured out I was there. I don't know. And that happened a few times. But this one time I was watching this movie that they were watching, and I was just intrigued by it. And they said, you know, Chauncey, why don't you come up here with us? <laughs> right? And watch this. And so after the movie, I said, what was that? And they said, well, that's, that's about St. Francis of Assisi. It was Brother, Son, Sister Moon. Does anybody re remember that? I was just fascinated by that movie. I was like 11 or 12 or something. And... Uh, seeing that, I said, who is he? Where did he live? When did he live? Well, we went up, pulled the encyclopedia off the shelf and opened it up, and there is St. Francis of Assisi and a little picture of the tower at the Basilica. I remember that. And we read about St. Francis of Assisi, how he lived in the 12th century or the 1100s in Assisi, Italy. Now I was trying to, Assisi, Italy. Okay, 1100, and I'm thinking of my, thinking, I read history, 1100, were there Christians then? Yeah, there were Christians. Yeah, okay. So it's, and I'm like putting it together. It's after, the, after Jesus and the apostles, but before us. And I just, I realized that there was this enormous gap in history for me about when Christians lived, right? There is, there's kind of a joke. It's not entirely a joke. You can actually find it. But it's a little bit of a joke that in in Lutheran children's books talking about the faith. You say, there was Jesus, and he had his apostles, he chose them, he picked them, he taught them, then he uh, died and he rose again, and then there was Martin Luther. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but it's, it's, it's on the same page, right? So, um, so I really, there's this huge gap that I had never imagined, I never thought before that there were Christians then, or where they were, and he was Catholic, and he, you know, was started the monastic order. I'm like, what is that? So this was all new to me, and I was fascinated by that movie, and I thought about it a few times, and then I, I found a comic book that my father had when he was a kid called Brother Sebastian. I don't know if anybody remembers those or how famous he was, but I just, I opened that book, and they're just little pictures of a monk doing different things, right? One time he's fishing, where it says no fishing, and then he didn't catch anything, so he wrote amen, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but my favorite one was Brother Sebastian, uh, and there were no caption, there was no words. He was, he was in, his, uh, in, his, in his, you know, potato sack or whatever, and he's out there doing his laundry, and he's hanging up his pants on the line and next to the monastery, and all his pants have holes in the knees. And I looked at that, and I'm just like, wow. That's right. <laughs> so this little comic book character, Brother Sebastian, somehow that and St. Francis of Assisi kind of made an impact on me, got my imagination going. Uh, but it didn't really go that far because I didn't know really about Catholics at all. Um, around the sixth grade or so, usually Lutheran kids were studying for confirmation. I didn't. My parents were going through some trouble and then separated at that time, and I didn't, I didn't study for confirmation. 
And I, I probably would have except that I started going to another church with a friend of mine, a non-denominational Bible church, uh, Scottsdale Bible Church in the, in the Phoenix area. So we started driving up there. I went with him first and to seventh grade and eighth grade and started going on Wednesday nights to their youth group. And then from there uh, did, uh, went to the summer camps, you know, and then Sunday morning. And then I started getting in, involved in a, in a small group uh, with, a, with a leader and then um, uh, some other kids, other boys my age. And we just really learned how to study the Bible. So there, I learned how to open the Bible. Well, I knew how to open the Bible because in the Lutheran church gave me an affection for the Bible. I loved the Bible. I didn't always understand it, but I loved it. I trusted it. I knew it. I liked it. I liked reading it in the pew. Um, so I loved scripture already, but I didn't know how to study it. I just knew how to read it and kind of pick up more or less sort of what's going on, but I didn't really know how to study it or how to connect the dots. And so I learned that there when I was in the seventh grade, eighth grade, and high school at that non-denominational Bible church. Um, let's see. Then uh, we went to go visit some family in Florida and went to, uh, they, uh, they went to a non-denominational church out there. And so I went there, and I remember the pastor at the end of the service told us, close your eyes and put your head down. And he started inviting us to give our life to Jesus, right? And I was hearing him do this. And I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. That's what I've always, that's all I always wanted to do. But the way he described it, it was like I'd never done it before. So I raised my hand. I want to give my life to Jesus, right? And so, you know, I, I, I did. And... Um, as I look back on it now, that wasn't the first moment I did because I always loved Jesus. I just never heard it put that way before. And so that's what I wanted to do. Um, but that started with me a conscious commitment to saying, I've given my life to Jesus. Now, how, how do I do that every day? How do I begin to practically do that? Um, and so while I was there, um, I... I learned a little more about uh, that and reading the Bible and, and uh, uh, also uh, in, my, in that, uh, the family, they had uh, these comic books about the Catholic Church. They were Jack Chick comic books. Anybody know that? So all these little comic books about the horrors of the Catholic Church and why everything is wrong with it. I read them all like two, three times. I didn't know anything about Catholics. I was curious. I was trying to understand. I'm like, who are these Catholics? What are they, you know, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, and so I was reading books. I felt sorry for them. I felt sorry for the poor Catholics uh, after reading those. And I, after that, I wasn't even sure they were really uh, Christians. Um, didn't know what to do with that. So uh, in high school, I spent more time reading, began to read more in my house, pray more in my house. Um, and even when we go to church on Sunday, if the pastor's sermon was good, mom would give me two or three bucks, I forget what it is, we'd go buy the, the tape of the sermon, and then I would take it home, and I'd put it in my cassette player, and I would go to sleep listening <laughs> to the pastor's sermons. Not all of them, but the ones that I liked, and so I learned, that got it into my head uh, with scripture. Um, I went on these mission trips to Mexico, we did some building for a Sunday school, all that. We played uh, basketball on the basketball court out there with some of the people, and it was in front of the Catholic Church. And I remember, here's the basketball court, here's a couple of houses and a store, and there's the Catholic Church. I just didn't know anything about it. It was mysterious to me, right? I was just ignorant. Um, and so I continued to, uh, uh, to grow in my faith there. An, an illustration about my connection to the Catholic Church when I was a kid, I was in the Phoenix Boys Choir, and so we would sing different places. Well, one year, one of our Christmas concerts was at a Catholic church, a big one, in the Phoenix area. And I remember going in there, and it seemed big and pretty, but mysterious, the crucifix and a lot of things. The crucifix was just a little bit more graphic than the one I was used to, <laughs> right? And the statues of Mary and Joseph and the different, and, and, I, and I just remember thinking, this is, this is unusual, right? I, I wasn't, it wasn't used to, it was unfamiliar to me. Um, and then, here's a, a story. I remember 
uh, one year, my dad and I were driving through Tempe, Arizona, which is where ASU, the main campus is. And now we'd driven through Tempe a lot of times because we grew up in South Scottsdale and Tempe's right next to it. Uh, and Tempe was not a rich town. Uh, so their streets were usually pretty sun-beaten and cracked and the street signs were old and the lamps were older and all that stuff. Well, he and I were driving through there one time and the streets were newly paved and newly painted and the street lamps were uh, brand new and the street signs were brand new and some of them were illumined with the street names on them. And I said, wow, look at the streets in Tempe. And so just joking with my dad, I said, what, is there a king coming or something? And he says, no, the Pope is coming. That was 1987. I was 17 years old. And I said to my dad, with all sincerity, who's that? Not like, who's the Pope right now? Like, what's a Pope? <laughs> I was 17. I had no idea. Uh, I, it, it never, it, that's how ignorant of Catholics I was. So I guess somehow I missed it in the Chuck Chick comic book to make the connection, but uh, uh, in any way. Uh, in high school also, I started, we went to a prayer group there on Wednesday mornings and prayed for the school. Uh, and um, I remember one person, so I'm a junior year in high school in a history class right after lunch. There was a girl who sat behind me. She was a Jehovah Witness. And somehow we got to talking before class or whatever. And I think when she found out, you know, my religion and, and, she, and I found out her, she was Jehovah Witness, we secretly decided to convert each other, <laughs> right? <laughs> that was kind of our secret hope. So about once a week, we would meet and discuss things, Bible verses, history, that sort of stuff. And we did that for the better part, probably almost the whole semester, right? And uh, what, I, what I learned in that uh, is really that most of what we had been taught about each other was not entirely correct. <laughs> and so that uh, if you want to learn, what I learned from that is if, if you want to learn about somebody's faith, you have to learn it from somebody who believes it. Because, you know, a non-Catholic can stand there all day long and very intelligently tell you why the Catholics are wrong. But he's not qualified to teach you that. Because why? Faith by definition, and every Christian understands this, faith by definition goes beyond understanding. Not against it, not contrary to it, but beyond it. Understanding can't reach where faith takes you. And so if faith goes beyond understanding, a person who doesn't believe is de facto unqualified to teach that. <laughs> it seemed pretty simple to me, right? And I learned that there. So I'll come back to that. Um, my senior year, there was another movie made an impact on me. Uh, my high school English teacher, who was a Methodist, as a matter of fact, a lot of my growing up, I went to, I went to public school all the way through, but uh, I had the good fortune of many of my teachers, not all, but many of my teachers being themselves very devoted Christians. And they wouldn't pronounce it everywhere. It wasn't part of class, necessarily. But, you know, we got to know them. So you have a teacher for a year, and you find out where, you know, what, what her inclination is or from somebody else uh, because they live in the neighborhood. Uh, a story on my first grade teacher, uh, Ruth Sentos, she, in the class, and I was in first grade. I didn't know, right? So in the class, she had up the star and the camels and the wise men going across on the bulletin board in public school. And my mom, who was a preschool teacher before she had me, she comes in and sees that and says, wow. She said, I love your bulletin board. Are you allowed to do that? <laughs> and her answer was, probably not. <laughs> but she put it up anyway. And the principal, I'm sure, didn't call her on it because he was also a devoted Christian. So <laughs> I had the good fortune of going through public school, still having the support and the, and the, and the help of Christian teachers, even though it was never part of the curriculum or never something that they addressed with me directly. Uh, but anyway, this high school English teacher, uh, at the end of the year, if we had finished through the syllabus, and we'd, she worked us hard and got all the way through, she said, your final project can be to write a report on a movie. 
But she says, you don't get to pick the movie, I do. And the movie she picked was A Man for All Seasons. And I had never seen that before. And we watched a little bit of it in class. And after class, I told my friend who's in the class, I said, I'm not going to do well on this project. I didn't understand anything in that movie. <laughs> so, so he found a way to rent it from a video store when those used to be a thing, you know. And, uh, and so uh, he watched it and I watched it. I remember I took a Saturday. I watched it five times all the way through just so I could barely begin to comprehend the movie. And uh, so I, I passed on paper. But I, I got attached to that movie. And I began to watch it every few years um, from that movie, A Man for All Seasons. Uh, one best picture in what, 1964, something like that? Uh, great movie. In any case, it was about St. Thomas More, right? And his, uh, and his relationship with King Henry VIII during the, the Church of England separating from the Catholic Church. And so Catholic began to make a little bit more sense to me at that point and knowing something of what it is and what the history is. Um, it made a big impact on me. So I've had Zeffirelli with his brother, son, sister, Moon, and St. Francis, and then, uh, and then uh, A Man for All Seasons. I was at the community college for two years, uh, continued to study music, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a music teacher. And that, I studied a lot of music. It prepared me well for college. Uh, I hung out with friends. I did music. Uh, I went to my other classes and studied there. I worked. I had a job. Uh, and, um, you know, I had discovered girls, I guess, in junior high. But college was the first time that girls discovered me. So <laughs> it took them a while, you know? They always said the guys were slow. I don't know. But anyway, so that year... Um, I was mostly just spending time with friends or working or studying music. And uh, my friends knew I took it seriously. Uh, but there wasn't that much growth that year spiritually because I didn't really focus on it. But it turned out to be important for me. Um, I went, chose to go from there to Florida to a Baptist college. My cousin went there. I had relatives in Florida and they were all Baptist or non-denominational. So I went over to there to visit her at the college and I tried out, I auditioned while I was there, applied for a scholarship, applied to the college, I got in, I got a scholarship, it wasn't a full ride, but it was pretty good. And, um, and so I went to college there, to a little college called Palm Beach Atlantic College. It's now Palm Beach Atlantic University. Um, and the music department was in an old church basement. <laughs> but we had the greatest professors, honestly. Uh, it was a really great department. The facilities were pathetic. But the, the education was really fantastic, and I'm, I'm glad I went there. So I went to the, to the Baptist College there, and uh, I didn't always... Um, I went to the Baptist Church there a few times, because it was started from First Baptist of West Palm Beach, right? So I went to that church a few times, and it just didn't click with me, right? So I started going to a non-denominational church that... Uh, my cousin and her roommate went to, and a few other people, they were giving me a ride. And so I started going there for a couple of years. Uh, and then uh, when the ride graduated, and I had no way to get there anymore, I, I discovered that there was a, a Lutheran church just up the road. And so I decided to go there. Now to kind of set up for that, I was studying music and music history. And with music history, I discovered church history because the two line up pretty well in the early part. And I didn't know. I started discovering these writings from the early church fathers. I didn't know they existed. I, I didn't even know we had those things. And here in the library, because I was working in the library, uh, and there were these volumes of the early church fathers. And so I helped a few people look things up for projects. I looked some stuff up and read them, some things. Uh, regarding music in the early church. And I discovered Leo the Great. Oh my goodness, what a great preacher, right? Um, and St. Irenaeus and uh, several others. And so as I, as I discovered that and read that, I began to be more, wow, I just thought, gosh, this early church looks pretty Catholic. And um, reading that then, I began to be drawn more to a historical church, a church with historical roots. Now, I would 
went to the Baptist church a few times. We went there every day for Wednesday chapel. And um, I remember my friends telling me, my Baptist friends telling me, that when it came to things like tradition, right? Because we just got to church church. They said, tradition, you know, we don't have tradition. Now, I didn't grow up Baptist. So I looked at them and laughed and said, yes, you do. You don't see it? Oh, no, we don't have tradition. Well, they've been told they didn't have tradition. But they were loaded with it. But that's okay, because everybody's loaded with it. It's not bad. Um, The Lutheran church was loaded with it. The Baptist church is loaded with it. The different churches are loaded. Catholics are loaded with it, right? We all have tradition. But what I thought was... If I'm looking for a church with historical roots, right, and tradition is the way you hand things on, and I'm looking for a church who understands the balance between scripture and tradition and how those things relate to each other, a church that doesn't even acknowledge it has tradition, or at least where most people don't acknowledge they have tradition, is not a healthy way of dealing with that question. (laughs) I'm not likely to come to a good answer with that. So he says, that's not the approach I want. When I took a look at more Catholic things, it seemed to me that tradition just overwhelmed everything. And so I came to the Lutheran position, which was my heritage, which is, and Luther's stance was what made the most sense to me at that time, and that is that tradition is important, it's good, but it can get corrupted, and so scripture always has to refine the tradition. That's very close to the Catholic understanding. And so scripture is over top of tradition to refine it, to kick out the things that aren't biblical, but to hold on to the things that are. Martin Luther, for instance, believed in the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He was a big fan of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He didn't believe in venerating her as Catholics did, but he believed she was very important. I remember my Lutheran pastor, when I started going to that Lutheran church, I started to be there to to, uh, sing and so forth and... uh, And I remember he said to me one time as I got to know him a little bit, and he said, uh, he says, you know, Luther thought highly of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he says, I I think highly of her too. He says, but if I preach that from my pulpit, I'll lose my job. (laughs) Yeah. So there was some tension there. Um, In any case, I was getting a little ahead of myself, but... Um, So I started attending the Lutheran church that was just up the road. It was Missouri Synod, which is what I was used to growing up. I went in one Sunday. I just, I could walk to it from my uh, apartment. And I walk to it, and I go in for Sunday service, and there's the hymnal in the pew that I knew so well, my 1942 Lutheran hymnal. And uh, we sang the music, and we said the prayers, and I all recognized them all. I could kind of go through all of them, but this time the words impacted me. They were so much deeper, so much richer than I had known before. And I'm, after years, coming back and reading this prayer book and saying, wow, these are great prayers. Look how wonderful these are. And so I was really drawn to it. I introduced myself to the pastor uh, and began to attend regularly um, and began to work with the choir and did Bible study with the teenagers a little bit and uh, talk with the pastor. And I felt really at home. So for the first time in my life, I started thinking about ministry, ordained ministry in the Lutheran church. Uh, people had asked me before, hey, don't you want to be a minister? I'm like, no way. I don't want to be a minister. I don't want to be a pastor. So, but I started thinking about it for the first time. And realizing that, I realized in studying more of the Lutheran church and the Lutheran tradition, I thought, I need to know more about the Catholic church, right? To understand the contrast. And so I knew from my experience in high school, talking with a Jehovah Witness girl, that if you're going to learn something about another faith that you don't understand, you have to learn it from somebody who believes it. Well, I had some friends who were Catholic, and there was actually a girl in my German class, and she, I discovered her and she discovered me. How's that, right? So we actually went out on several dates and we started, uh, but I got to know her family pretty well. Uh, and they, wow, she lived her faith. She prayed. She was holy. Uh, she, her family was Catholic all the time. I mean, they, she was proud to be Catholic. She, um, uh, she could explain her faith. If I had a question, she had a good answer. I'm like, wow, this is great. 
And, uh, and her whole family was like that. I got to know her brothers a little bit. Uh, and so I got to learn more about uh, Catholicism. So as it happens, um, uh, she, she and I had been uh, dating for a couple of years, and there was uh, a class in her parish that they were teaching the Catholic faith. And she says, you know, if you want to learn about the Catholic faith, because you're thinking of Lutheran ministry, uh, why don't you come to our church where our priest is teaching a class on Monday nights? So I went. Well, it was the RCIA class. But there were a lot of people there, all right? So that year, 33 people came into the church in that particular parish in uh, Lake Worth. And there were over 100 people in that class. Because parishioners came to learn from this priest. He was a good teacher, but it was also the year that the new catechism came out. And his class material was the brand new catechism of the Catholic Church and the, the Mass. So the... the uh, the Missal Romano, or the, the book that's on the altar. And that's what we did. We used to do the catechism and the mass, the prayers of the mass, and that was our text. And so he was teaching the Catholic faith. We went through all these different parts, and I understood him. I understood him. He was so clear to me. And the reason he was clear to me was because he had grown up Baptist, and turned out he was a really good linguist, but his family was poor. He couldn't afford to go to college. So he taught himself Turkish in like a matter of months, right? Then after he taught himself Turkish, he joined the army and he went around with the army as a translator for four years, came back, went on the GI Bill and went to college and he ended up getting his doctorate in ancient languages. And he read all the early church fathers in their original language. And he, just as he got his doctorate, he entered the Catholic Church. And so as he did that then, uh, then he waited a couple of years, and then he went to the seminary. And he went all the way through the seminary. Uh, even though he had his doctorate, he started at the beginning, went through the Catholic seminary. And then he was the assistant priest or the assistant pastor at that parish. And when he was teaching, I thought, I understand this guy. He explains Catholic teaching like I haven't heard it explained before. Um, what's, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden things started to make sense to me. So I recognized apostolic succession, what it was, why it was so important, and that I believed in it. Um, the, I had to wrestle for the first time with, did Jesus establish a church? You know, Matthew 16, where Jesus says, you know, you are Peter, and upon you I build, upon you I build my church. And so the question, like, did Jesus build a church? Does he have a particular church that he built? I never thought of that question before. It never occurred to me. It's not like that I rejected it. I just didn't know. I thought, wow, did he build a church? <laughs> Is this what he's trying to do? So I, as I read that and uh, read it in the catechism and heard him explain it and I wrestled with it on my own, um, I began to accept these things more. Understanding of the role of sacred tradition um, and all these things began to appear to me. I began to see how they were biblical. Also at this time, I, I was reading another little book called Confessions of a Roman Catholic. It was an old booklet. And it was written by uh, a Protestant pastor who had become Catholic. And it was basically the story of his journey. And he explained it very well, right? And so I read that, and boy, I read that, and I wrestled with it, and I prayed. I prayed um, to know... What, you know, gosh, what am I supposed to do with this? And then go back to my Bible and read it and go, darn it, it's biblical. Darn it, right? The reason I, you know, I, would, I grew up Lutheran and I'm studying the Catholic Church and I think, and I would tell my family, you know, I'm studying the Catholic faith, but I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to become a Catholic. They're all, they're wrong. I just want to know from their perspective what their beliefs are, but you don't have to worry about me becoming a Catholic because it's, it's not going to happen. They're wrong, Right? But as I began to pray more and wrestle more and go, doggone it, this stuff's biblical. What's wrong? You know, what's happening? Um, and so I read more of the Reformers to try to understand their arguments better. And, I, and it started to seem less credible to me. Or even if it was sincere and, 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 uh, and strong, 
that it seemed to me to be outside the apostolic way of interpreting scripture and handing on tradition, right? And, and that's kind of a, that's a question a lot of folks miss. You can read the Bible and you can get taught the Bible from other people and you can, you can understand it and, and, and come to understand what it says and what it means. So that gets handed on to me from people before me and it, it was handed to them by people before them. So the idea is you trace that all the way back to the apostles. So what happens when I'm taught stuff and then I go back and read the apostles and they never heard of it? There's a break somewhere, right? Um, and so that break comes from interpreting scripture with tools that do not come from scripture. Scripture interprets scripture. That's what I was always taught. I still believe it. But a lot of ways of interpreting scripture in the modern church, right? Modern uh, Protestant churches and even sometimes some Catholic scholars, sometimes ways of interpreting scripture are from outside scripture. And that's what I, that's, I looked at that and I thought, well, that's human tradition. So human, you know, human tradition is important, but if you import human tradition to interpret scripture and you come up with a different answer, that's not the right way to interpret scripture. The New Testament interprets the Old Testament. So the methods that scripture uses to interpret scripture are there in the Bible. And what I found is, doggone it, the Catholic Church uses those. And some of these other churches, the method they use, it makes sense, but I don't see it in my Bible anywhere. So uh, that began to be more of a draw on me as I wrestled with the Catholic faith. So now I begin to realize that more and more the Catholic faith made sense to me, except for a couple of things. Mary and purgatory, Right? Those are the two things I just couldn't, I'm just like, nah, those, that just, ugh, the Catholics are wrong on those two things. Even if they're right about everything else, those two things they're wrong on. So in my journey, I kept wrestling with this and I only wanted what Jesus wanted. Like my prayer was, Lord, you lead me where you want me to go. Teach me what you want. I'm yours. I'm your disciple. You teach me. Um, and I wasn't attached to a particular thing now. I liked the Lutheran church where I was. I still do. I have a great affection for it. Um, but I wanted him to lead me where he wanted me to go. I remember a conversation I had with a close friend of mine, Matt, who uh, he's now a Baptist pastor. We still talk from time to time. He's a real good friend of mine. And I told him, Matt, he was, he was saying, what are you doing? You know, you can't go over to the Catholics. Why are you saying these Catholic things make sense? And I said, I'm not abandoning Jesus. You know, I'm, I, I says, without Jesus, I can't breathe. So why would I leave him to go to something else? I'm, I'm only going where he wants me to go. I'm only being led what he shows me is the truth and what he's doing. He says, the only way I would ever enter the Catholic Church, which at that point I didn't think I was going to do, but the only way I would ever do it is if Jesus led me there. And I was completely convinced. Um, I visited with my mom uh, and... Uh, told her about my journey, but I told her, don't worry, the Catholics are wrong, I'm not, I'm not going to become a Catholic, um, <laughs> right? But a couple months later, after having gone to the RCIA classes for, since September, right, I was, I was in my living room and reading my Lenten devotional from the Lutheran Church, and the Lenten devotional there was talking about our fears and how Jesus helps us to conquer our fears and to live through our fears and and it said what are you afraid of list them so I listed you know uh, I'm concerned about you know if I'm good enough I'll be able to audition well enough to get a job teaching music because that's what I was studying and then the second thing I put was um, I wonder what my family will think if I become a Catholic and I kind of shook my head and I set it down I go whoa how did I just think that how did I just write that right and so uh, I started talking with the Lord. Now, every day I met, every day I went for prayer uh, in the apartment where I lived. Uh, the living room had a couple of couches and a chair, and I would sit in the chair or one couch, and Jesus was on the other one. I mean, he was just there every time, and I would always look over to him, and we would talk with the Bible, with my questions, with whatever. I was wrestling, and I says, look, if this is from you, 
you, you need to do something because I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Everything makes sense to me except marry in purgatory. And I said, so out of frustration, almost as a dare, I suppose, I said, I know you. You know, I, I can recognize uh, the importance of Mary, but I don't know Mary. So if you want me to know Mary, you have to introduce me. And so he did that day. I just started, in my conversation with him, I just started moving, and Mary came in, and he told me about her, and it, was just, it wasn't like all the words were there, but just the understanding started to come in. And I realized at that point, oh no, I'm in big trouble, <laughs> right? I'm in big trouble. So I thought, oh, what am I going to do? You know, I says, well, it's just purgatory. But then I thought to myself, Chauncey, you've got to be reasonable here. Everything... Everything has made sense. Everything's come together. Everything has proven biblical. If all these things that you were sure were contrary to Scripture are now proven to be very substantially biblical and, and demonstrated in, in, in the church's understanding of Scripture as handed on to her, then, then purgatory is eventually going to make sense. So what am I going to do? So it was, I think, a Friday. Um, it was a Friday morning. And the class was Monday night. And so I says, well, if, I, if I'm all excited, I better just wait. So I says, here's what I'm going to do. I will talk to the priest on Monday night. And if I talk to him and he says it's okay to come in, then I'll decide to come in. But I'm not going to tell anyone until then because I might change my mind. Between now and... That was my test to make sure I wasn't just... Ah, all right, all excited and on some bump that I was going to fall off of, right? That was why I thought Monday night will be enough time. So I did, I waited, and uh, Monday night came around. I talked to him, and he was surprised. He says, well, you, but you, he says, if you want to come in, he says, you've been here for almost every class. You ask questions, right? Um, he says, let's meet on Saturday. So I think you can, but let's meet on Saturday. Get, fill out these papers, right? He needed me to, to fill out stuff. And uh, he asked me, is this about the girl you're dating? Because she's Catholic. And I says, no, it's not about her. It's about me. I said, if she became a Lutheran, I'd still be here talking to you. Because I'm convinced. I'm not, I'm not changing churches for her, right? So, uh, so we met on Saturday, and we, we talked for about three hours. And he, what he really did was a great favor to me. He basically said, well, he says, you know, you're coming in from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. I came in from the Baptist Church. And he says, no church is perfect. But he says, let me get you ready for what you're about to see. And he says, let me tell you what the Catholic Church is like. <laughs> and he gave me a very real description of her faults and her troubles and the way he's wrestled with things, not in a bitter way, in a love for the church, in total devotion to the church, but recognizing that with all her faults and the faults of so many of her members and the troubles and difficulties in the church does not change who she is. And so he talked to me and says, do you still want to come in? <laughs> After that whole list of troubles and what I was in for. And I said, yeah, I do. I'm convinced. So he says, okay, so you come on in. So that's when I started calling my family and my uh, friends and told my roommates. One of my roommates cried. He's like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> uh, he'd, he was a, he'd grown up Pentecostal. He was at a Baptist college, of course. He was working at a Baptist church as a music minister. And he and I would talk because he was fascinated. There was a, an Anglican church, Bethesda by the Sea, out on the island. Beautiful Anglican church. Oh, my gosh, gorgeous with all the great tradition of the Anglican tradition and music and everything like that. And he would go to late night services there. And he just loved it. He thought, this is great. And he told me, and he says, but don't tell the pastor I'm working for. I'll lose my job. I can't do that. So uh, in any case, I told him he cried. And we talked about uh, my, you know, my decision to do this. And so uh, he was real good, real good hearted uh, guy. I told some of my other friends. Um, told my mom, and she, Whoa, right? <laughs> What's my son doing? My dad said, what about, what about the priesthood of all believers? Well, it's like, let me tell you, Dad, I actually understand that one. So I started to explain it to him. Um, and so, and then I ended up coming into the Catholic Church that Easter, which was in April of 1995. Um,
so I went down to talk to my mom in person, uh, and then uh, after that then uh, came into the Catholic Church, and I just started going there. But then I, then I ended up, after graduating, so that was in West Palm Beach, Florida, the Diocese of Palm Beach, I guess, or West Palm Beach, not sure. But then I uh, came back to Arizona after I graduated, after I did my student teaching, and started going to a church in Phoenix, St. Thomas the Apostle, uh, was my home parish there, and uh, just came in and started working, doing interviews and all that, uh, to get a teaching job, and as I was there, I just kind of got involved in life, and I just kind of uh, wasn't sure, I, I mean, I, I was Catholic, and I was going, but I started to draw away maybe from the idea of ministry, because as I was thinking about Lutheran ministry, and then God draws me into the Catholic Church, I'm like, whoa, put on the brakes, <laughs> Because I started seeing myself as a priest. I'm like, eh, right? This is a whole new deal. This, uh, this is, you know, the bargain is different now. So I, uh, I wrestled with that for a long time uh, about, because I had always thought, you know, get married, have a wife, two kids, a dog, right? So uh, I was always looking forward to that. Um, and so when God started calling me in and, you know, celibacy was part of the deal, I started to talk with him about it. I'm like, hey, we need to, you need to help me here. And uh, I need to be convinced of this because these two things go together. So um, I had kind of let it slide a little bit. Uh, I talked to the priest in Florida about it, and he said, it's great that you're in. He says, but if you want to become a priest, if you're thinking about that, I encourage you. He says, but maybe wait a year or two because you're brand new. I says, you know, I think that's what I'm going to do. So... uh, as I was in Phoenix and I just started teaching and getting involved, I got a job at a Catholic elementary school, was teaching the kids music, loved it, we had a great time, uh, learned a lot, uh, and then uh, I ended up that year applying to the seminary. Here's how it came about. So uh, I was living with my grandparents because I didn't have to pay rent. I could help my grandmother with my grandfather, who had just had heart surgery, and my grandmother was a very good cook. <laughs> so. So without having to pay rent, I could finish paying off my school loans more quickly. Um, so in the morning, every morning in the shower, I'd be just getting ready, thinking about the day, what's going on, you know, and I'd be talking to the Lord, just be talking to him. And I remember after a while, you know, with the, the question of the, going to the seminary, and he, he basically, I said, he says, you about going to the seminary? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm waiting five years on that. We're putting the brakes on that. Five years is a good round number. I like that. And so I remember he said, well, what about four years? I said, no, five is a good number. I like five, right? So that went on for a little while, maybe a couple of weeks. And so after a couple of weeks, I said, okay, four years. He says, what about three? <laughs> At this point, I began to suspect where this was going, <laughs> Right? And say, no, four years is good. I agreed to four. We can stick to four. What about three? And so when I said, okay, three. This took weeks, right? I said, okay, three years. I'll go into the seminary. And then he says, what about, and I says, what about two, right? And he says, no, what about you go when I call you? When do you want me to go? No answer. I says, I'm ready. Just tell me when do you want me to go? No answer. So, going to the church there, the parish, uh, I don't know how, you know, it's a few weeks later anyway, and I was there at daily mass, and there was a young priest up on the altar, the associate, really nice guy, good preacher, uh, a little bit spacey, but uh, anyway, he was up there on the altar, and he was saying the mass, and he gets to a particular point, and he says, oh, he says, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, he says, I skipped over a whole part of the mass, he had skipped over the preface, before the Eucharistic prayer. And so he says, I got to go back. And so he went back and to that page, and he says, I'm sorry, we'll start here. And he started there at that part. At that moment, I says, I'm going to talk to him. (laughs) I can talk to him, right? He's not intimidating. So I went and just mentioned to him, kind of, I'm thinking about the seminary, not sure. So he asked me some questions. We talked. I met with him one or two times again, and he says, let me introduce you to the vocation director. Uh, So Father Rob Clemens at the time was the vocation director. And so I went and talked with him. I met with him after work. So 
I think I met with him in the rectory at Our Lady of Mount Carmel, probably at like 8.30 or something like that. It was later. Um, anyway, I met with him. We talked for about an hour, an hour and a half. And I told him why, you know, this seems quick to me. And he asked me a bunch of questions. And, and then he says, you know, I, you might be ready. I think maybe you're ready. He said, so I've got an application here uh, when you're ready. And so he told me how to turn it in. I took it and I left it in the envelope. <laughs> I left it there, you know, and for probably a month, uh, a little more than a month. And then I finally decided to pull it out and start filling it out. So I filled it out and... Uh, then I sent it in, and that began to uh, open up the door to my entering into uh, the priesthood, uh, or at least to the seminary. Uh, and I remember I had the conversation with the, the religious sister, the nun, um, who was my principal at the school, the Catholic school I was teaching. She said to me, she said, are you all right? You seem a little distracted. <laughs> so I'm like, well, and I told her I was applying to the seminary. She says, oh, that's great. She says, oh. I'm going to lose my music teacher. <laughs> but she said, that's okay. We'll do, the Lord will provide, we'll find a way. So um, in any case, uh, so I went through that whole process. And the, the process for entering the seminary is pretty tough. I mean, they, they really drill these guys, right? And so by the end of the whole process, after going to the, the psychologist and having a friend of mine go to the same psychologist over at the Mayo Clinic and going for a uh, physical and meeting with different boards and filling out all these things and getting all these letters of recommendation and all this stuff, writing these essays. Um, I turn that and then I go and I meet with a board that's in front of me and they were asking me pretty tough questions based upon all that stuff. And I left that room, I'm like, well, that's it. It's a good thing I got my teaching job because <laughs> seminary is over, right? But they accepted me. Uh, the bishop accepted me and sent me to uh, the seminary. And I went to St. Meinrad Seminary in Indiana. Benedictine monks, it's a Benedictine arch abbey, uh, and they run a seminary for diocesan priests and monks, so there are others who study there for priesthood. Uh, and I was there for six years, although one of those years was back in Phoenix for a pastoral year. And so that whole journey in the seminary, I thought, uh, you know, I, I want to be a priest, and at first I was convinced, this is where God's calling me, this is what I have to do, and I was, I think like a lot of young people, I was hard on myself, right, and so when I says, this is what I need to do, when I would confront an obstacle or a problem or, or a weakness of mine, I would just decide to, <clears throat> and push through, right, well, I found out after a while in the seminary, that doesn't work so well, <laughs> um, and so I learned how to, uh, you know, more deal with, open up and deal with what's going on inside of me, my hesitations, my weaknesses, bring it to prayer, bring it to confession, bring it to spiritual direction, and uh, in that, come to a, a, a more open, if you will, embracing of the priesthood. So instead of, this is what God wants me to do, this is what I need to do, to get to a point where I'm in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel uh, at night, and I'm, you know, before I went to bed, about, that was about eight o'clock or so, uh, and I'm in there, and I'm just talking with the Lord. I'm like, this, and I'm like, I don't know whether to stay or go. I have this frustration and that. And so, and you know, you've been helping me, but I need more help. Well, you know, I need, I need more help in this. This is a struggle for me. And I said, you know, what, what if I did something else? What if I went out and, you know, what if I went out and had a life and had a career, taught at the Catholic school, and maybe had, got married and had a family and all that stuff? I remember he just told me, okay. I says, but you called me to the seminary to be a priest. He says, I'm inviting you to be a priest. You don't have to be one. I'm inviting you. This is an offer. If you want the offer, I'll be faithful to it, and I'll give you what you need. But if you don't want the offer, it's okay. Go and live a good life. So... Boy, that brought a lot of peace. And then processing that, I stayed and continued to study uh, and continued to work uh, with a new heart uh, for the priesthood. Because even though I wanted it, the way I was dealing with my weaknesses and obstacles was that I have to do this, I have to do this. Instead of God's inviting me and this is what I want. It was a, it was a different approach and it, was, it helped me to... Um, 
to really, it helped me to really love the priesthood and embrace the priesthood and embrace celibacy uh, even, uh, even more uh, happily in that. And so um, in that, I ended up going to the cathedral for my first assignment. I was there with Monsignor Michael O'Grady, loved that parish, great. Uh, we had, we started a second Spanish mass while I was there and that filled up too. Uh, and so I'd hear lots of confessions there, lots of funerals, uh, lots of baptisms. We would do sometimes uh, over 100 baptisms a month in that parish. And so we would do them in groups, <laughs> right? Um, in any case, uh, it was a big parish, a busy parish. The office was like a bus station, <laughs> bustling all the time. Um, from there, uh, Bishop Olmsted came in, uh, and so he moved into the rectory. And he just took the empty room upstairs, you know, no fuss, just kind of came in and took the empty room. And so uh, he's, I have to say, he's a good housemate because he doesn't talk business at the table and he doesn't talk business in home. He, he you know, we, we talk about priesthood, the joys of priesthood, ministry, uh, family, you know, different things, but we don't, we didn't talk about business. Uh, and so that really helped my priesthood a lot. Monsignor Michael O'Grady, his simple approach really helped my priesthood a lot. Father Frank Peacock was there, who, uh, who was at um, Our Lady of Fatima Parish in a poor part of Phoenix for probably f almost 40 years. Uh, and just learning from him uh, as well was, was great. So I went up to Flagstaff. I was there for two years. Wonderful experience up there with a school and so forth. And then the bishop uh, sent me here to be here. So I've been here almost 14 years. And so I'm this is where I'm getting most of my gray hairs up here, right? I had a beard and flagstaff because it was cold, but I shaved it so I'd come out here. But this whole thing is a journey with the Lord Jesus, right? It's not just about theology. It's not just about uh, reading history. It's not just about liturgy. Although all these things fit in, it's about what I learned from the beginning, that I've loved Jesus as long as I can remember, right? I just learned to trust him and to talk to him and, and to treasure the Bible, right? To have an affection for it. I mean, you know, to say the Bible is important to me, that's important, but to have an affection for it. Like every time I see my Bible, I just want to go touch it, <laughs> right? Uh, to have that kind of affection for the Word of God and to enjoy reading it uh, is what I learned in the Lutheran Church in my childhood. Then uh, to study it and to learn how to put the pieces together I learned that at the, at the Bible church. My battery's going dead. Maybe that's a sign that I should. Uh, and then in, in coming into the Catholic faith, I felt like, this is what I felt like. I love the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. I even told my Lutheran pastor when I was talking with him about, you know, gee, I think I'm going to become a Catholic. This is, <laughs> right? Uh, and he says, I was afraid of that, you know. Uh, but we had a good rapport. And I says, but I tell you what, I says, the Lord is calling me to the Catholic Church because I believe that is his church and that's where he needs me to be. I says, but I'll tell you, the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate is still my favorite. <laughs> so he's like, well, okay. He didn't know what to do with that. Uh, there's just a deep affection I had for it. Still, I enjoy reading the theologians there because in the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, you had... We had half a, dozen, half a dozen really good theologians. And you read them, and you got it. Right? It's kind of, going from that to the Catholic Church, where there's so many you can't count them, and there's from so many different centuries, and so many different ages, and so many different cultures, and languages, and points of view. And, oh my gosh, it got so, it's like being taken out of a birdbath and thrown into the middle of the ocean. It was overwhelming in a beautiful way and also scary at the same time. Um, that's what the priest, Father Julian, was telling me about. Let me tell you what you're in for, right? But um, at the same time, God is faithful. And the big church, the bigness of it, and sort of the, the not being able to just feel comfortable in it, like I'm in my own little chair sort of a thing. I do sometimes in some places, but mostly in the whole church, you know, it's less comfortable than that. That's, to me, where a lot of the mystery is, that God is in charge of the whole thing, that a human being couldn't possibly run <laughs> this, 
right? The Pope has an utterly impossible job. Nobody could possibly do that job. Pretty much every bishop has an utterly impossible job. Who, can, who in the world, what human being could do that job? And the answer is that God is the one who's doing all this. And as messy as it is, it still works. The salvation of the world is the messiest business there ever was. Just look at the cross, right? And that's a very tame one. We don't see all his scars and lashings, right? We don't see what disheveled shape he would have been in on the cross. He looks very sort of strong up there, right? Um, to look at the cross and to see the messiness of it and how he got there and what happened afterwards and what happened with his apostles, it just shows you how messy the salvation of the world is. And it's not any tidier now. So the church is messy. The Catholic church is messy. Uh, and like the apostles, she runs here and there and fights between herself once in a while. But nevertheless, she's his church because um, he founded her on, on uh, he founded her on himself and on, the, and on what the Father gave to St. Peter, that profession of faith. So uh, anyway, that's some of my journey uh, and it's with the Lord all the way uh, because it's about the Catholic Church is Christocentric, right? I was, I'm walking with Jesus all the way through this. If Jesus wasn't the center and everything in the Catholic Church, uh, I wouldn't have been able to come in, but he is, he absolutely is. And from the outside, when I used to feel sorry for Catholics and think they were confused and think, oh, those poor Catholics, they don't understand. If they could just simplify their faith, they would be better off and they would love Jesus. Um, I came to understand little by little what Catholics had uh, and, and how Christocentric the church is. Um, in any case, I could go on, but that's, that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> um, there are parts that are missing, but I can't, I can't fill in everything. Um, last week we talked a lot about purgatory. Uh, this week I gave my story. Uh, I'll open it up for questions, but what I would urge you is, think about your story. How has the Lord walked with you? Where has he called you? Where have you walked with him? Where have you walked away from him? You know, how did he bring you back? Because you're here, or at least you're listening, right? So what's your story? How can you give a testimony to how the Lord has worked in your life? It doesn't have to be clean and tidy. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be real. And you can say, this is my story, and this is how I know Jesus, and this is why I'm glad to be here, right? That's a great witness. So I urge you, think about your story. Maybe write it out and tell a few people, because that, that's important. So any questions? Yes? So I came in in 1995. Um, I would say a few people, my mom's mom, my grandma, she accepted it pretty much right away. Um, my mom took several years before she could accept it. She had to visit me at the seminary and she came with her guard on, right? She came with her Bible. She was armed with stuff, right? Came to the seminary and uh, her little booklets and all that. So, um, uh, it took her several more years, but now she's Catholic, and she's been Catholic for, oh, I lose track of time, four years, five years. So she's, yeah, she came into the, she's got a great little parish up in Georgia, so where she is. Um, so she's Catholic now. Uh, my dad is not, but he came to accept it, right? His question was, what am I going to do for grandchildren, right? <laughs> so <laughs> he says, don't you want to be an Anglican priest? <laughs> so... Um, uh, my, my grandparents, my grandfather was an engineer by trade, but after he retired, his hobby was Lutheran historian. Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, he put out a newsletter every month uh, called the Lutheran Vanguard. He wrote books. Uh, one of them was on the seminary reading list for seminaries, and it wasn't just history or something. His point was how the clergy run the church. He thought clergy had too much power in the church because even though Lutheran theology in many ways is similar to Catholic. The ecclesiology, the understanding of the church and who the church is, is very different in the Missouri Synod. It's more, I don't want to say it's fully congregational, but it's more of a congregational type of thing. Like the pastoral council, the pastor doesn't have to be there. The, financial count, the finance council, the pastor isn't allowed. <laughs> 
That's how, here's why my grandfather wrote the book, right? So coming over from Germany, this particular group of Lutherans came over and they had a bishop with them, Bishop Stephen. And uh, the Stephanite emigration to, to the United States. So the Bishop Stephen then was with them for a while and he helped them to settle in and then he went back to Germany. The church there discovered that he took all their money with him. After that, pastors were never allowed in finance council meetings again. <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's the history. So um, I don't know if they've changed, and maybe are, but when my grandfather wrote the book, nope. So, uh, so he, he came around to kind of, he didn't understand it, uh, but he, you know, he and I had a good relationship, so we didn't make it an issue. My grandmother, God love her, with all the love in my grandmother's heart, when I became, when I went to the seminary, she says, well, she says, you know, Chauncey, I love you. You have to do what makes you happy. But I hope you flunk out. <laughs> and if you can imagine, I love that phrase because my, she didn't, there was no harm in that phrase at all. She just meant it with all her heart, that what she wanted for her grandchild. She just didn't understand. So she, she would support me in what made me happy, but she hoped that I flunked out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. What year was this uh, 2003 in Phoenix at St. Simon and Jude Cathedral. Yeah, June 7th. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Look at that. Any other questions? Good. There we are. No questions about the girlfriend, huh? <laughs> I usually get those. I'll tell you, she's a consecrated virgin, and she's, last I heard, she was in Jerusalem, working in Jerusalem. She's been around different places. I actually met her. She came out to do a retreat for high school women out in the East Valley in Phoenix, and she let me know that she was going to be there. So I went over there and met her, and we talked for about an hour and a half. Uh, and that was whew, nine or ten years ago. I lose track. Maybe eight years ago. Uh, so it was a while ago. But anyway, and she was in. Uh, she was up in New England at the time. But I, uh, I heard from her brother and uh, from somebody else in this diocese who knows their family that she was working in Jerusalem. So there we are. Good. Let's pray, and again, I urge you, think of your story, remember your story, be glad for your story, and share your story with one another. As St. Peter says, to give an account for the hope that is within you. Be prepared to give an account for the hope that is within you. It's not theological arguments he's talking about. It's what the Lord has done in your life, uh, and how you can be glad for that and share that with others, because that's real, and it's the Holy Spirit that, that really brings it fruit out of it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we give you thanks for your faithfulness, how you walk with us step by step on every part of our lives. You're always there, you're always faithful, you're always calling to us. Uh, Lord God, we thank you for uh, drawing us close to you, opening our hearts to you, and helping us, by your gift of grace, to love you, and to love the faith you have given. Help us, Lord, by the gift of your Spirit, to rejoice in your good company, to rejoice in your call, to rejoice in your promise, and to rejoice in the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church uh, that you give us to live in uh, and to know you. Help us to know you and love you more, and to know your mother more and more, to know uh, all the angels and saints uh, more as you draw us, Lord, into your kingdom, into the fullness of your kingdom. Uh, so, Lord God, we thank you for tonight. We ask you to Bless our memory and help us in the telling of our stories, especially to those that we love and we want them to know you more. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. Yeah. So that... Anyway, uh, that's all. <laughs> I could go on and